Great. Well, wel welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, so we're, go we're going to start our second panel. Um, our, our first speaker is Professor Marcy Hamilton, who's the Robert A. Fox Leadership Program Professor of Practice and the Fox Family Pavilion Resident Senior Fellow in the Program for Research on Religion at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also a founder, CEO, and academic director of Child USA, a nonprofit academic think tank at the University of Pennsylvania dedicated to interdisciplinary research on child abuse and neglect. Her writings include God versus the Gavel, The Perils of Extreme Religious Liberty from Cambridge University Press, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. She was a law clerk to US Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, she received her BA from Vanderbilt University, an MA in English and fiction writing from Penn State, and both an MA in philosophy and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania. So Professor Hamilton. Floor is yours. Thanks so much. Uh, th this is really, you know, we're, we're living in very difficult times, but this is uh, a wonderful respite today to be thinking about these issues and focusing on them. So thanks to Carl for your persistence um, and Roger Williams University for being able to um, continue this uh, despite a pandemic. Uh, and of course, thanks to the Freedom From Religion Foundation. So, uh, you know, the question that was given to us uh, was, did the framers intend the U.S. to be a Christian nation? Uh, and of course, this is a completely loaded term, Christian nation. Uh, and, you know, one meaning of that phraseology is that it means Christian control of the United States. Uh, but that is a version, uh, in my view, of the um, Nietzschean concept of the will to power. Uh, and in fact, um, the, the notion that we have a Christian nation in which there is a mandate uh, to control with certain beliefs, I think uh, is completely inconsistent with what the framers were thinking. Um, and, and frankly, how the framers, most of them, many of them had been trained. So there's another meaning uh, that I'm going to posit for what it means to be a Christian nation. Uh, and it is based on the intellectual history of the constitution. Uh, and in particular, the influence of Calvinism uh, and reformation theology. So uh, the reason that I think this is such an important concept is that it is an antidote to what we now have uh, with the phrase Christian nation. Uh, it's an antidote to will to power. Um, the, the Calvinist concept that was at the base of the thinking of the Constitutional Convention had two features. Um, and it was really, um, I mean, it was Presbyterians one moment uh, of shining light of uh, example in uh, American history, uh, but, but it turned out to be foundational. So the two premises that I'm going to talk about that are derived from Calvin through the framers uh, are that you need to expect that every human, including the ones uh, at the very top, will abuse the power that they were, are given. And secondly, the solution to those kinds of abuses of power is a structural solution. Um, you know, at the same time as the United States Constitution was being debated in the city of Philadelphia, across town, the uh, Presbyterians were debating their own constitution. Uh, and there was a very important influence. Uh, he was the chair of the Presbyterian uh, Convention, uh, but he was also the educator of a number of the framers, uh, and that's John Witherspoon. So, uh, and, and by the way, just as a side note, both conventions ended up with constitutions. Um, and in my view, uh, having studied them both, I think the, uh, the framers at the, uh, of the United States Constitution actually did a better job than the Presbyterians in terms of creating a lasting structure, but that's a side note. So forgive me for reading for a minute because I wanna get the numbers right uh, of who was who and where they were at the time because this matters. Um, you know, some form of Calvinism played a role in the lives of at least 23 
of the 55 framers. It played a central role in the lives of two framers who were most influential on the question of representation and were intellectual leaders at the convention. And that's James Madison and James Wilson. James Madison attended the preeminent Presbyterian college of the country. At that time, it was called the College of New Jersey. Of course, now it's Princeton University where he says he himself, Madison says he was prescribed a strong dose of Calvinism. James Wilson uh, was educated at the Presbyterian St. Andrews of Scotland, and he was raised in a very strict Presbyterian home. The theology of Calvin, uh, John Calvin, generated three major traditions, Presbyterianism, Congregationalism, and the Dutch Reformed. Um, but the majority of those at the convention who were affiliated in some way with Calvinism were influenced by Presbyterianism. Six of the framers were Presbyterians themselves. Hugh Williamson of North Carolina was a Presbyterian minister. 10 framers, two of whom were Presbyter Presbyterian, were educated at the College of New Jersey. So 10 of the framers were educated either by John Witherspoon or by uh, Finley, uh, Samuel Finley, who was deeply influenced by Witherspoon. Um, so the, the largest collection of people at the convention uh, who shared a, an educational background were those who came from what became Princeton, um, but was at the time uh, the leading Presbyterian college in the country. Uh, and they were taught by uh, Witherspoon. Three of the framers were Congregationalists, um, uh, but uh, they were, they were sharing not so much the structural concepts, but what I will end up discussing as the baseline understanding that we need to understand why the Constitution is not a Christian nation in the sense that it's being promoted uh, in this day. Um, so the 10 framers who were educated at Princeton, the College of New Jersey, were Bedford Brearley, uh, Davy, Dayton, Ellsworth, Houston, Madison, Alexander Martin, Luther Martin, and Patterson. All of them had been steeped in Calvinist uh, precepts and the compulsory twice daily chapel. Uh, and uh, frankly, the college was um, founded for and devoted to uh, Presbyterian principles. And River Reverend Witherspoon was referred to as a a whole staff of instructors all by himself. And so there is every reason to believe that um, Witherspoon had uh, a strong hand in the ways in which the framers were looking at how you construct a constitution. Um, but uh, the other reason it's worth looking to Witherspoon is he's the only clergyman who was uh, involved in, not only during the Revolutionary War, he was the only one whose influence extended through the drafting of the Declaration, the Articles of Confederation, the Continental Congress, and then through his students at the Constitutional Convention. So, so who was Witherspoon? Uh, well, he was widely respected. He had tremendous influence. He was not thought, he was not an innovative theologian. Um, but as the chair of the committee that framed the Presbyterian Constitution and the educator of so many framers, he did impart very clear um, but, but useful to understand guidelines on how government should be formed and how government should operate and how it should be um, treated by the people and by the rulers. So, if you look at Calvin's project and the Framers project, their, their projects were quite similar in the sense that they were both intended to save a failing social organization. For Calvin, he was trying to save the Christian church. For the Framers, they were trying to save uh, what at the time had been called the Articles of Confederation, of course, uh, but both were sent on a project of uh, they weren't trying to discard everything that had been previously done. Uh, they were trying to say what was best about it. Uh, and in both circumstances, what was most problematic about what they were facing were the abuses of power. Uh, and uh, in both circumstances, the answer to those abuses of power was a structural answer 
which was intended to be able to funnel the likely tendency to abuse power through channels that would then deter those abuses and then serve the larger good. So the, the fundamental insight that Calvin uh, had, but also that Witherspoon took and then fed uh, on a daily basis to uh, the framers who had been educated by him were, was the inevitability of the corruption of all human beings uh, and the likelihood that someone who is handed power will then turn around and use that power for selfish reasons and for reasons that don't serve other people. Um, but at the same time, what do you do about the fact that you have to have an operating government? You have to have some way to cabin that power and to channel it toward the larger public good. And so, you know, essentially what uh, Witherspoon taught was there were three choices. Um, and government is a set of building blocks. And those building blocks are put together to fit the people that they will be governing. So it, it's not that uh, monarchy, representation, or direct, direct democracy, the three options, that any of them is ideal. Rather, it's that the, um, the building blocks are available to be manipulated and to be shaped in order to find a way to uh, halt the likely abuses of this particular people at this particular time. So in the Presbyterian constitution, there's a phrase um, that then rings true through um, both our constitutional history, but also through the thoughts of the framers at the constitutional convention. And that is that uh, the organizing structure is reformed, but it's always reforming. Uh, and of course, this is consistent with Madison's deep despair uh, when the framing of the Constitution was ended. And essentially, he then says, uh, I, you know, I, it, it may not work. We may not have the, the good people to fill the roles of this Constitution in order to make this a success. And uh, the answer, though, was that, well, perhaps we'll just keep fixing it. So the Constitution was never intended to be perfect. Uh, it was intended to meet the needs of the particular era, and that's why it would need to have an amendment procedure. Um, of course, Jefferson thought it had to be uh, amended ex extremely frequently, and that didn't happen. But um, the concept that uh, we have a system that is intended to be altered in the face of abuses of power, I think is a, a powerful message to those who would say, no, um, this is a government that needs to be constructed in the eyes of one set of religious beliefs. So the Congregationalists from the Calvinist tradition, of course, uh, endorsed direct democracy. That was not one, uh, an approach that either uh, uh, Witherspoon or Madison or the other um, Calvinist influence framers thought was the answer. Uh, they really did believe that direct democracy would lead to anarchy and even licentiousness. Um, so to quote uh, a Presbyterian thinker of the time, uh, man's depraved apostate condition renders government needful, needful both in the state and the church. In the former without government, Anarchy would soon take place with all of its wild and dire effects, and men would be like the fishes of the sea, where the greater devour the less. Nor is the government in the church less needful than in the state, and this for the same reason. So what you can see there is two aspects of this. On the one hand, this uh, strong foundation assuming that everyone who has power will be tempted to abuse it. But at the same time, you need governing structures and you have parallel institutions. They're not the same institution. You have a government of uh, the people for uh, secular government and you have a church government. Um, and that was a predominant way that the Presbyterian mindset, but in, in particular Witherspoon, looked at the, at the concept. So... 
Uh, you know, one of the, if you go back to John Calvin's um, Institutes of the Christian Religion, which I'm sure you all did yesterday for fun, uh, what, what you will find is that um, he was outraged that of all the institutions in the world that would fail, it would be the church. How could the church fail? And his answer to how the church could fail was that it was sinful humans at the top and throughout the church that led to the church's failure. So that what he prescribes is to go back to the ancient church, look at their organizational structure, which by the way was representational. And he says, if you look to representation, you're going to see a greater chance for um, avoiding the excesses that we will have uh, if we solely trust individuals. So it, it wasn't that he believed the church should be wholly eviscerated. It was that it needed to be reconstructed in order to channel human nature to be uh, more likely to serve others rather than just um, the self-interest that he saw at the time. So um, this is what leads us to uh, understand in the context of the Constitutional Convention, what was the attitude that the framers brought to the convention? Now, if we look at the notes of the debates, as opposed to um, anything else at the time, what we see is debates about how to cabin power. So the, the presupposition among the framers gathered uh, was that everyone would in fact abuse their power. And the debates were about how to limit power. They weren't about whether or not um, there would be a class of individuals you could trust. Uh, they, they weren't debating how do we make sure that the most highly educated and the most patrician are at the top of the government. Uh, instead, they were debating, okay, if we put any man, of course, that was the concept, it was all men at the time, but if we put any man into the government, um, how can we construct the government so that he is led to serve the larger good and not just his own good? Uh, and so on the one hand, it is uh, following this concept of you, no human is perfect, but, but far from that, every human is problematic. Uh, and, uh, but you can generate good if you have an institution that is constructed that will work together. So, uh, so this is the, the language himself of, um, of Calvin that then Witherspoon takes forward and then we see the framers reflect at the time of the convention. Let us hold this as an undoubted truth which no siege engines can shake. The mind of man has been so completely estranged from God's righteousness that it conceives, desires, and undertakes only that which is impious, which is perverted, foul, impure, and infamous. The heart is so steeped in the poison of sin that it can breathe out nothing but a loathsome stench. But if some men occasionally make a show of good, their minds nevertheless ever remain enveloped in hypocrisy and deceitful craft and their hearts bound by inner perversity. Now, the, the re, that is about as negative as you can get about human nature, but why is it valuable? Why is it valuable at the Constitutional Convention? Why is it the lesson that Madison and others brought to the convention as a useful way of thinking about what needed to be done next? And obviously the usefulness of it is that it teaches the necessity of assuming human nature can't be trusted and therefore the structure must be constructed in a way that it won't be. But, but notice to what happens when you start talking about a reformed constitution, a reformed government always reforming. What does that mean? Well, a reformed government always reforming is reflecting the fact that those humans are going to use the current structures to their own ends. And if you don't keep amending and reforming the process, then we will have that which Calvin was fighting against, which is corruption of even the church, 
you're going to have corruption if you don't keep meeting the challenge that is raised by each human being to the system that's in front of them. Uh, and so, in a sense, uh, the, the gathering of the convention and the, the shared universe um, that they lived in, uh, at, at least a majority of the framers, um, and it, it, it was the viewpoint that uh, was predominant among the conversations, was that uh, you can't possibly think that anyone that we put in power is going to be capable of doing this without us putting them in the right system. And if we fail, it will, because, it will be because we have failed to create the system that generates the most good. It won't be because um, we didn't find the right people to fill those positions. Because frankly, there is no right person in the sense of one who won't be tempted to abuse their power to the detriment of all around them and of the people as a whole. So Calvin really structured what uh, focused his concepts on structural mechanisms, which makes him quite distinctive from Martin Luther. Uh, and those structural mechanisms ended up being part and parcel of the, the um, classes that Witherspoon would teach to the framers um, that ended up at the, at the convention. So the, the, there were three primary evils that needed to be addressed. Um, and these were the evils that were in the pre-Reformation church and they're the evils that were also identified at the convention. Uh, one, we had humans that had abused their power. Two, they had shirked their responsibilities. And three, they had failed to serve the people. I mean, that sounds like something that would have been out of the convention and not um, Calvinist work, but though that is precisely what Calvin saw, and that is what Witherspoon imparted to his um, students. And so the fear was of cruel tyranny and lawless, unrestricted domination by those who are not restricted by a system that works. But what Calvin saw was that you could construct a church on the basis of the church that had gone wrong. Um, and so, uh, and it didn't need to be constructed identically. So you could take the monarchical structure of the church at the time, and you could turn it into one that was more accountable to the people. And the choice that was made was a church in, in um, uh, through Calvinism and through the Presbyterian interpretation of Calvinism was a church of representation. Um, and so at the very same moment in Philadelphia, we had the framers of the Presbyterian constitution debating what would be the best structures for this Presbyterian constitution in order to deter abuses of power. And the framers we're also debating what would be the structures that would deter the abuses of power. Now, it's not that I'm advocating that they were telling each other at the convention that we have Christian principles and we should apply those Christian principles, right? You know, I mean, my favorite story of the convention of all was when the suggestion was made that they should have a, um, a, a member of the clergy to come in and read a prayer because they were fighting and it was not too pleasant. And of course, everybody knows it was really hot and unpleasant in Philadelphia in the summer. Um, but you know, the response to that was, well, if we brought in a clergy member to do a prayer, we have to pay them. Does anybody want to pay them? Nobody wanted to pay. And that was the end of that discussion. So the, the, the convention was not led by a member of the clergy. There was no explicit discussion, but the principles that were created uh, in response to the problems of the Catholic Church through the Reformation were brought to bear through the education that Witherspoon had imparted through Madison and his strong dose of Calvinism and through the other members of the Constitutional Convention that had been educated uh, at um, the College of New Jersey, which um, was 20% of the convention um, and, and some of the, uh, definitely the leaders. Um, 
So I, I, it, it's not enough, though, to look solely at the Calvinism of, of uh, Witherspoon by itself, because, of course, Witherspoon also brought with him uh, concepts from John Knox. And the, the failure uh, in, in Witherspoon's view and also in the views at the time, the failure of Calvinism was that he never did um, say that the people can rise up against their rulers, that, that um, it is okay to be in opposition to your rulers. And instead, Calvin essentially said that if the rulers are tyrannical, that is in some ways a judgment of the people. So you can't stop um, solely with um, that perspective, but you veer off into uh, John Knox and Presbyterianism. And what he added was there is a duty of the people to check their rulers. And so you have this fundamental concept of absolute distrust of any human being in power. You have an answer that a structure will help it. But then what Knox adds is that it's a structure, but it's a structure that will only succeed if the people can criticize um, and hold their uh, leaders to account. And so you can see through these, um, these precepts what is starting to form at the Constitutional Convention is a concept um, of overarching structure that is driven by two things, by the need to secure uh, the ability to stop abuses of power, but at the same time to create avenues so that the people cannot be trapped by the structure that's created and that they can respond. So, uh, Witherspoon lectured his students, and his particular students were Brearley, Davy, Dayton, uh, William Churchill, Houston, and um, Madison on the different types of government. He did it under the heading of legal lectures on moral philosophy, but here was his prescription for good government that Madison um, clearly took from the classroom into the Constitutional Convention. And then James, the brilliant James Wilson reflected this, um, having been educated at St. Andrews. One, the first is that wisdom is needed to plan proper measures for the public good. Uh, and uh, in other words, uh, there must be thought and care put to the construct of government and to the experimentation with government. Um, two, um, you should have fidelity to nothing but the public interest. The only legitimate goal of the formation of the structure of government is the public interest. Three, and, and this I think is interesting uh, in light of the fact that the framers, of course, uh, met in complete secret uh, and had a, an agreement that they would not talk to the press. You need secrecy, expedition, and dispatch in carrying out the measures of a government. And fourth, you need uh, unity uh, and agreement uh, among those who are uh, firming the government and part of the government. Notice the first two qualities are all about the qualities of good government and they're defined by accountability to the larger good. But the latter two stress the pragmatism um, of uh, Witherspoon, which is that you are supposed to put these building blocks of government together, whether it is pieces of monarchy, pieces of representation, or pieces of direct democracy. But when you put them together, um, you must do it in a way that will be effective. And so why do we have one president uh, instead of a committee of presidents? Because there was an, a debate about, well, what will happen if we make the executive branch led by a committee and then we have a, a bicameral legislature. And the answer was, well, you really do, in the end, need one person to lead in moments of emergency. Uh, that was the pragmatism of the construction of government that Witherspoon um, certainly imparted to his students, but also uh, Samuel Finley imparted to the other five framers trained by him. So, uh, so the, the what is this Christian nation I've just described? It is a structure 
that is built on precepts that are derived from a particular religious view at the time that was dominating the intellectuals of the time. But it is not a structure that is, uh, it's not that the United States Constitution is copying the Presbyterian Constitution. I mean, to the contrary, they were being drafted at the same moment. It's rather that the United States Constitution sits on a Christian concept, which can be adopted as a secular concept. And that concept is that everyone who holds power will abuse it. Uh, and I, I don't think there's ever been a time in history when this message was more important. Uh, or the message of the government needs to reform. It needs to be reformed, but it constantly needs to be reforming. And so for those who are shocked by a president who, ha who sees no limits, it's because the current structural configuration is inadequate to cabin the goals and the ego of this one person. But uh, you know, Calvin through Knox, through Witherspoon, through Madison, um, they wouldn't have been surprised at all. They assumed that there would be individuals who would operate in a lot of the ways that the current president of the United States is operating. And so what the very basis of the constitutional experiment must be distrust, distrust of every human. But it's distrust, distrust combined with the hope in human capacity to construct a government of balance and interdependence. And it's, it's, it's best understood, I mean, at the time, the image that would have been used was the image of a clock, of a watch where you have independent variables, but they're working interdependently and you have no operation without each of them doing their job correctly, um, but independently. So the, the goal here is that we have a constitutional system which is built on the paradox of distrust and hope, but at the same time, the absolute necessity, the baseline foundational view is that it is impossible to build any institution that will permanently guard against abuses of power by human beings. And instead, institutions must continue to be structured over the course of the time to meet the likely abuses of power. Um, so, let me just then bring this back up to the, um, to the current situation. So, you know, what is distinctly Christian about the United States constitutional experiment? What's distinctly Christian is the view of human beings. It's the view, frankly, of um, um, that old fashioned concept of human nature. Uh, and it is, um, I would say that that view of human nature is evidence-based. Uh, it's very hard to show examples of those with power who do not at some time likely abuse their power. We now see it writ large, but it is still what we should expect. And why is the United States Constitution relatively successful over the course of um, centuries? In my view, it's probably because of that one Christian element, which is that you can't trust anybody. But it, it's not a Christian nation in the sense that everybody should believe the same thing. And of course, everybody shouldn't believe the same thing because of the radical finitude and the failure of any human being to fully understand either the Constitution or their role or themselves. That's the basis here. So we should assume all those with power will abuse it. Um, and uh, we should put hope in the solution being structural, and we should assume it will be imperfect. So what I'm pointing to is a profound humility that is divorced from the concept of this is a triumphal Christian nation that is driven by particular Christian concepts. As I said at the start, that view of Christian nation is much more akin to Nietzsche's will to power 
than it is to anything that the framers or the framing generation were thinking. And put in its proper light, we have a constitutional system that demands reformation because of its understanding of the tyranny that results from unchecked human power. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Hamilton. Um, uh, for anybody uh, in the audience who has questions for Professor Hamilton or for any of the other panelists so far, there will be uh, an opportunity for you to ask questions starting at 1245. Um, uh, our, our next panelist is uh, uh, Professor Stephen Green, who's the Fred H. Paulus Professor of Law and Affiliated Professor of History and Religious Studies and the Director of the Willamette Center for Religion, Law, and Democracy. He's the author of seven books, including most recently, uh, The D Third Disestablishment, Church, State, and American Culture, 1940 to 1975 from Oxford University Press, and dozens of book chapters and articles about religious freedom. From 1992 to 2002, he was the legal director and special counsel for Americans United for Separation of Church and State. He received a BA from Texas Christian University, a JD from the University of Texas, and both an MA in American Religious History and a PhD in History from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He did graduate work at Duke Law School and Duke Divinity School. And I wanna say it's a great pleasure to, to meet you, Professor Green, who, I, who I've never had the pleasure of meeting before. And I just wanna say in my, I do a lot of work on nationalism and the constitution. And in my book chapter, my forthcoming book chapter on Christian nationalism, you are by far the most cited author in, the, in that chapter, I think by uh, a loose count. I think your, your work is, is cited uh, 15 times in that chapter. So it's a, it's great to to finally meet you, if not in person, at least virtually in person. So uh, the the floor is is yours. Okay. Thank you, Jared. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> also appreciate uh, the invitation to participate in this uh, uh, with uh, the kind. Uh, support from Roger Williams University and from the Freedom From Religion Foundation. So uh, thank you all for um, the invitation. Let me see if I can get to my PowerPoint. Hold on a second. Well, here we go. All right, can everybody see that? Is that good? All right. You'll have to be one of the, uh, I guess, upsides of us now having to be doing remote learning and remote teaching is I've not discovered, but I've been addicted now to um, Google Images and just to try to keep my classes uh, paying attention when we're uh, going through these topics. And so um, it's amazing what you can find on Google Images. All right. Well, one of the most resilient debates of American history is clearly the one over the nation's purported religious founding. As predictable as the Chicago clubs, uh, Cubs collapse every summer, uh, legal and religious conservatives raise claims about America's Christian heritage in their attempt to gain the moral and legal high ground in the on ongoing cultural wars. One recent example of this is um, a Sunday sermon back in 2018 by Reverend Robert Jeffers of First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. In that sermon titled, America's a Christian Nation, Reverend Jeffers asserted that the nation's founders were predominantly evangelical Christians, that they intended to instill Christian values in the nation's governing documents. America was founded a Christian nation, Jeffers insisted, and the nation's law and institutions need to rediscover and reaffirm this basis. Now, while Reverend Jeffers' claims could be passed off as the ramblings of a fundamentalist preacher, Dallas First Baptist Church is actually, I think, the largest uh, congregation in the nation's largest Protestant denomination. And so it cannot necessarily be completely discarded. Reverend Jeffers is not alone in, in his ramblings. He is part of a large group of political and religious conservatives who raise similar truth claims and use Christian nation arguments to promote a conservative political and social agenda. 
More than a handful of Christian nationalists have access to the holders of the nation's political and judicial powers. Jeffers, for one, is a member of President Donald Trump's close, uh, closest religious advisors serving on his evangelical advisory board. Although claims that America was founded as a Christian nation have existed for a long time, ebbing and flowing in response to cultural forces, the maxim witnessed a resurgence in the latter decades of the 20th century, carrying over into the present century. For some time now, investigative journalists at Religion Dispatches and Church and State Magazine have been documenting the rise of Christian nationalism. Now, before proceeding any further, uh, the proposition that America is a Christian nation requires some defining. Now, defining it is more difficult than it looks because the concept of America as a Christian nation has a protein quality to it. There's a high degree of scholarly consensus about the religious impulses behind the settling of British American colonies and the significant role that religious rhetoric played during the founding period. Um, there's less agreement, oh, though, over whether there's a direct correlation between Calvinist covenantal theology and biblical principles on one side and the sources of Republican principles on the other. Proceeding even further in this taxonomy, a smaller number of scholars and popular writers argue that the Protestant ethos pervaded the founding period rather than in Enlightenment theory. And the ubiquitous religious rhetoric indicates that the majority of people, including the political leadership, held Orthodox Christian beliefs and that the framers of the nation's governing documents intended to incorporate Christian principles into them. And then finally, even a smaller number of writers, which is probably represented more by the uh, uh, picture on the right, they claim the United States was actually specially blessed or chosen by God and his providential hand directed the framers in the nation's founding. So under this last perspective, the nation's past and founding documents assume almost a sacred quality. So it can be appreciated due to the variety of potential understanding and the fluidity between perspectives it can often be difficult to decipher what one means when speaking about America's Christian heritage or that it is a Christian nation. So as a result of this, the rhetoric surrounding America's Christian foundings can appeal to a very wide audience. Many people hold vague, if not ill-defined ideas about America's Christian nationhood. In fact, a study by the First Amendment Center recently revealed that over 50%, I think it was 53%, of Americans actually believe the United States Constitution created a Christian nation, notwithstanding the express prohibitions in the Establishment Clause and the No Religious Test Clause. Now, that study is very ironic because that same study also indicated that 67% of the same uh, people responding believed that the Constitution requires separation of church and state. Now, I'm no mathematician, but when you have 53% saying it's a Christian nation and then 67% saying, separation of church and state, there's some kind of interesting overlap between them. Anyway, politicians are notorious for playing on these uh, pre uh, prepositions and in turn in reinforcing this narrative. Christian nation rhetoric has such low hanging fruit that many politicians cannot resist making at least vague claims. Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, and even Donald Trump have made such claims. These claims find support in what one scholar has called a veritable college industry of popular books that advance this narrative through highly selective and questionable presentation of historical data, what is often called proof texting, I think is what John mentioned earlier. So, so long as claims about the nation's founding political institutions remain in the rhetorical realm, there is less cause for concern. But as my article explores, the Christian nation rhetoric has long influenced judicial decision-making and variants of this maxim impact current Supreme Court jurisprudence. Now this is a cause for concern. So I want to talk briefly about the origins of the Christian nation myth, as I call it, how it was applied expressly in the 19th century, and then now how it's been manifested subtly in recent establishment clause decisions. Okay, so first, a paradox arises when considering whether America is Christian in a legal or constitutional sense, such that the nation's laws and policies should reflect and reinforce a Christian perspective. 
<clears throat> as noted, Christian nationalists and their scholarly enablers like to cite ubiquitous religious rhetoric from the founding period, some of it coming from the lips of our own founding fathers. After all, why would John Adams have said our constitution is made only for immoral and religious people if he hadn't believed it? Now, the reason a paradox exists is notwithstanding the presence of religious rhetoric, including affirmations of God's providential hand in the nation's creation. The nation's core founding documents are bereft of references to religious principles or affirmations of God's authority for Republican governance. Now to be sure, the Articles of Confederation concludes with an affirmation about the uniting of the states under one government, quote, please the great governor of the world. But that reference is hortatory, containing no claim of the authority of government comes from God. Similarly, as most people know, the Declaration of Independence contains four references or affirmations of a deity, but all of these references are in Enlightenment natural law terms. Now, in contrast to those declarations, the Constitution itself is bereft of even a passing reference to God. Authority to establish the United States is derived from we the people, not from any kind of higher authority. And the absence of an affirmation of God, even in Enlightenment terms, is remarkable considering that the majority of the state constitutions at that time contain deific affirmations. And this was realized by contemporaries. Contemporaries at the time noted and even lamented this omission. Anti-Federalists and their conservative clergy condemned the godless nature of the Constitution during the ratification debates, during the yellow fever outbreak in 1793, and then in the presidential campaign of 1800. So if members of the founding generation largely agreed about the nation's governing documents were based on secular rational principles, then how did this narrative arrive about the nation's Christian origins? Well, several events came together in the early 19th century that support the belief that America was founded as a Christian nation. The first event that fueled the reevaluation of the nation's founding was the extensive growth of evangelical Protestantism in the early 1800s, as John mentioned, fueled by proliferation of revivals commonly called the Second Great Awakening. <clears throat> this expansion of an evangelical perspective coincided with a general discrediting of the deistic and rationalist thought that occurred during the founding period as a part of the popular revulsion to the excesses of the French Revolution. In addition to seek reaffirmations of piety in the public realm, evangelicals held a post-millennial eschatology that taught that Jesus' second coming would occur after a thousand-year reign of a godly society brought about by Christians. That would take place in America. Evangelicals dusted off Puritan motifs of America being specially chosen by God as being the exemplar of the world. This belief of God's kingdom would manifest itself in America necessitated a reconsideration of the nation's founding, which the evangelicals quickly set out to sanctify. And this is manifest destiny that's on the right. So by the 1820s, evangelical authors were making claims about how God had directed the founding in their political endeavors. Evangelical reformer Lyman, Lyman Beecher declared in 1820, quote, our republic and its constitution and laws is of heavenly origin. It is not borrowed from Greece or Rome, but from the Bible, he said. Similarly, Reverend Jasper, Jasper Adams, who was a nephew and cousin of presidents, published a sermon in 1833, where he asserted that the United States had sprung from the efforts of, quote, our strong and pious forefathers and the exercise of a strong and vigorous faith the Christian religion, he said, was, quote, intended by them to be the cornerstone of the social and political structure with which they were founded. So these powerful Christian explanations about the founding of the Republic reinforced beliefs about American exceptionalism. And before long, they became the accepted narrative. Now, a related event coincided with the growth of evangelicalism and helped also fuel the sanctification of the founding. During the early 19th century, revisionist historians began to, re, excuse me, revision, revisionist histories began to appear that offered these glorified accounts of the American Revolution, its leaders, and the drafting of the nation's documents. This movement began almost immediately upon the death of George Washington in December 1799, 
where the first president was not only venerated, but turned into a deific figure. Second generation of historians set out to sanctify the founding and provide explanations for how 13 small colonies could defeat the most powerful nation on earth. George Washington became American Moses, who benefited from the interposing hand of God. Divine providence, and sorry, this is a quote, quote, divine providence gave George Washington opportunities and dispositions to add that great, add, to add great acquired, what he already had, uh, to the greatest of the natural abilities, proclaimed Reverend Henry Holcomb. George Washington's leadership was, quote, evidence of the disposals of a superimposing providence, he said. Same biographers turned this deistic leaning Washington into an evangelical Christian. Then the sanctification of Washington served to sanctify those events and actions in which he directly participated, including the drafting of the Constitution. Historian Catherine Albanese has written that the second and third generations of Americans by then, that Washington had become, quote, irrevocably linked to the Constitution, such that his Christian character infused the document and influenced his fellow drafters to ground the government on religious principles. So as a result, in the middle of the uh, 19th century, religious historian Robert Baird would write, quote, that most certainly the convention which framed the Constitution of 1787 under the presidency of the immortal Washington was neither an infidel nor atheistical character. All of the leading men in it were believers in Christianity, and Washington, as the world knows, was a Christian. This narrative only grew in later years. Decades later, revisionist historian Benjamin Morris declared, quote, that most of the statesmen at the Constitutional Convention were Christian men, including Washington. And as Morris concluded, the Christian faith and character of men who formed the Constitution forbid the idea that they designed not to place the Constitution and government under the same providence and protection of God and principles of the Christian religion. The Constitution, he said, was founded under the Christian influences and is in its purposes and spirit a Christian instrument. So by mid-century, this narrative of the nation's Christian origin was fully embedded in the popular literature, in school books, and in the public imagination. And there it would remain for much of the century. So how did this make a transition into the law? Well, the third event that helped create this Christian nation myth and then facilitate its application in the law was the resurrection of the old British maxim that, quote, Christianity formed part of the common law. Conservative American jurists, most notably Justice Joseph Story on the left and Chancellor James Kent on the right, perpetuated this idea in their very influential treatises. A story wrote in one of his published lectures, quote, there has never been a period in which the common law did not recognize Christianity as lying at its foundations. Likely the most famous legal decision of the early 19th century to rely on the Christian nation maxim was a New York case called People versus Ruggles, where the defendant was convicted of, quote, wickedly and maliciously blaspheming and uttering false and scandalous words, which were, quote, Jesus Christ was a bastard and his mother was a whore. Actually, if you look back at the blasphemy cases from the early part of the 19th century, they seem to be the favorite phrase, that Jesus was a bastard and his mother was a whore. Well, he was convicted at trial, and on appeal, Ruggles argued that his conviction should be overturned because New York didn't have a statute that outlawed blasphemy, and that even if it did, his conviction would conflict with the state's constitution that protected freedom of conscience. Brushing aside those sound arguments, Chancellor Kent upheld the conviction on the ground that Christianity was part of the state's common law. Quote, Christianity in its large sense, he said, as a religion revealed and taught in the Bible is not unknown to our law. But then Kent did more than simply affirm the law recognized and reinforced Christian principles. He actually declared the nation's dependence on Christianity. Christian discipline and virtue, he said, which helps bind society together, were essential instruments of civil government, he wrote. And then so, quote, whatever strikes at the root of Christianity tends manifestly to the disillusion of civil government. Now, judges would cite the Ruggles decision throughout the 19th century in upholding blasphemy convictions, Sunday law convictions, and religious oaths 
uh, requirements for jurors and witnesses. And in my article, I go into more detail about these numerous decisions in the early part of the 19th century, where courts applied this idea of America being a Christian nation. Now, this Janus-like ideas of America's Christian nationhood and the laws and cooperation of Christian principles received an additional boost in the 1892 Supreme Court decision, Holy Trinity Church versus United States. The New York Episcopal Church had been fined for violating an immigration law after it hired a new rector from Great Britain. The law prohibited going uh, overseas to hire anybody for any position in the United States. Writing for a unanimous court, Justice David Brewer held that the Congress had not intended that the hiring restriction apply to, quote, ministers of the gospel or any class whose toil is of the brain. But after making that statement, Brewer went on to offer a second reason for why the decision, besides just statutory interpretation, couldn't apply in this instance. According to Brewer, he said, quote, America is a Christian nation and founded by a religious people who formed a government based on religious principles. This required that all laws be interpreted in a way that was consistent with Christian principles. In addition to affirming the maxim that Christianity formed part of the common law, Brewer also expressly declared that the nation's institutions were grounded on Christianity. As he would state in a later public lecture, he said, Christianity has entered into and become part of the life of the Republic such as the principles of Christianity serve as the foundations for our social and political life. Now, even though Brewer had a nuanced understanding of what it meant to be a Christian nation in this sense of being a compassionate nation with responsibilities that flow from that, this declaration that uh, Justice Brewer made was seized upon by religious conservatives to justify their moral behavior enforcement and Brewer's Christian nation decision remains a favorite by Christian nationalists today. So what about the modern applications of this? Well, by the early 20th century, the maxim that America was a Christian nation had lost some of its resiliency. As my article discusses several reasons for this decline, part of it had to deal with natural law theories being displaced by legal positivism and realism, and increasing religious pluralism, advent of ecumenicalism, even the Supreme Court's embrace of church-state separation in the 1940s did not produce an immediate resurgence of Christian nationalism. Rather, it took the events of the 1960s and 70s to breathe new life into this narrative. The school prayer and Bible reading cases, um, which appeared to promote a cultural secularism, the social rebellion and unrest of the 60s, Roe versus Wade, reactions to these events led to the rise of the religious right in the 1970s and the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, which of course then cemented the marriage between Republican Party and the Christian conservative right. Conservatives insisted the Supreme Court's requirement that government must maintain a position of secularity and separation of church and state, they claim now was promoted hostility toward religion. So it was during this time that a new generation of Christian nationalist authors emerged, gained popularity among conservative evangelicals. Two influential, um, two influ influential figures were Rastus John Rastuni and Francis Schaeffer. Rastuni was the founder of Christian Reconstructionism or Dominion Theology. This is actually Schaeffer who is on the left here. Um, advocates establishing biblical theocratic principles for a republic based upon Old Testament law and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Schaefer, a very popular uh, author for evangelicals, argued for imposing biblical principles for government that went back to the Protestant Reformation. Both of these writers were highly influential on a generation of religious right leaders, including Jerry Fowle, there on the left, Pat Robertson, James Kennedy, and then a host of authors of popular histories about the founding, such as John Whitehead, David Barton, who's been mentioned, and Tim LaHaye of the uh, popular series, uh, among many others, okay. While there's no evidence that these Christian nation writers have influenced judges, particularly members of the court, their ideas were instrumental in the rise of a series of, uh, series of religious conservative legal advocacy groups. The first was the National Legal Foundation, 
initially affiliated with Pat Robertson. That was followed by the American Center for Law and Justice, headed by Jay Sekulow, as people who are familiar with him. Then the Rutherford Institute, headed by John Whitehead. Liberty Council, affiliated with Liberty University. Concerned Women for America, Beth LaHaye. Alliance Defending Freedom, among many others. In the 1980s, these groups started to file lawsuits challenging church-state separation, among other matters, filing amicus briefs at the Supreme Court. Many of their briefs on church-state matters raised what can best be called Christian nation light claims. Now, the first modern Supreme Court decision to rely on the nation's purported Christian heritage to resolve church-state conflict was a 1983 case of Marsh versus Chambers upholding the practice of paid legislative chaplains. Rather than applying the Lemon Test with its secular purpose in primary effect inquiries, Chief Justice Berger applied a historical pedigree test. Noting that the first Congress had authorized the appointment of paid chaplains three days before finalizing the language of the First Amendment, Berger asserted that this historical evidence sheds light on what the draftsman intended the Establishment Clause to mean. That holding did not turn solely on the timing of that coincidence, though. Berger also insisted that public prayer was part of the fabric of society. Quote, to invoke divine guidance on a public body entrusted with the making of laws is not, under these circumstances, an establishment of religion. And he concluded by quoting from the Zorak v. Clausen case from 1952 for the principle that, quote, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. Although justices had previously relied on historical data to inform their understanding of the purposes of the religion clauses, Marsh went further. It was the first decision in which historical, quote unquote, facts became determinative of constitutionality. Marsh was followed the year later by Lynch versus Donnelly, uh, dealing with the challenge of a public religious display. Berger again spurned the lemon test in favor of his historical approach. He asserted that there's, quote, an unbroken history of official acknowledgments of the rule of religion in American life. That history is replete with official references to the value and invocation of divine guidance in deliberations and pronouncements of the founding fathers and contemporary leaders, he said. And in no place did Berger discuss the context behind these acts or the political reasons that may have motivated public officials to employ religious rhetoric. In fact, he just took them on face value. These declarations were simply just part of the traditions and heritage that underlay the nation's foundings, he said. This history, Berger declared, reveals contemporaneous understanding of the guarantees of the religion clauses. Well, from that point, it was off to the races. The next religious display case, Allegheny County versus ACLU, 1989, witnessed the first a series of amicus briefs raising express Christian nation arguments written by the National Legal Foundation and Concerned Women of America, founded by Deborah LaHaye, like I said, who is the wife of Christian nationalist Tim LaHaye of the Left Behind series. Such briefing has only increased since then. In Elk Grove uh, School District versus Newdow in 2004, the justices considered the contentious issue of removing the words under God from the Pledge of Allegiance. The case elicited a plethora of amicus briefs that argued that the phrase was consistent with, if not required by, the nation's Christ, uh, religious heritage. The nation's founding documents acknowledge God, asserted the brief from Liberty Council and Wall Builders, which is the organization of uh, David Barton. And this brief was chocked full of religious statements by presidents and other public figures. Quote, without our belief in God, there's no foundation for our belief in the inalienable rights given by God. Other briefs made similar claims. Quote, we cannot read the history of the rise and development of a nation without a reckoning of the place of the Bible as occupied in shaping the republic, asserted the Institute for Basic Life Principles. Thus, it establishes the philosophy of God is the ruler and his transcendent laws are to govern and guide for superior and to be superior to man's laws. So these were the contents of these amicus briefs. The following year, the justices heard twin cases involving challenges to the public display of Ten Commandments monuments, McCrary versus uh, ACLU and Van Orden versus Perry, which uh, Dean Chemerinsky was the counsel of. 
Let me put this up. Here we go. Okay. Uh, the issue of the nation's Christian heritage was front and center in these cases. As the Kentucky displays were actually justified on the ground that the Ten Commandments have profoundly influenced the formation of Western legal thought and the formation of our country. Again, there's an onslaught of amicus briefs raising Christian nation claims. Quote, our laws, our, our uh, frame of government, our political history are not understandable without references to the biblical ethical monotheism, asserted the amicus brief of the Family Research Council, which is associated with James, uh, James Dobson. Likewise, the National Legal Foundation declared that, quote, authoritative voices established that the Ten Commandments impacted law and jurisprudence in America. In his plurality opinion upholding the Ten Commandments monument in Van Orden, Chief Justice Rehnquist borrowed evidence from the amicus briefs. It's interesting to look at the amicus briefs and look at his opinion. Though he stopped short of embracing their conclusions. Quoting from Lynch, uh, Rehnquist reaffirmed the unbroken history of our official acknowledgments and the role of religion in American life, but then went a step further to specify that it included the recognition of the role of God in our nation's heritage. After citing to Washington's Thanksgiving proclamation for the general proposition, he then segued into a more recent acknowledgement of the role that the Ten Commandments has played in our national heritage. Now, missing from that discussion was any citation to official acknowledgements or use of the Ten Commandments that coincided with the Foundings, in part because that historical evidence is lacking. But as Christian nation nationalists are apt to do, Rehnquist was happy to draw from generalities to reach a specific conclusion. Now, in contrast to uh, his uh, majority opinion, a plurality opinion in there, in uh, Van Orden, Justice Scalia's dissenting opinion in McCrary openly embraced the Christian nation narrative. He said, quote, those who wrote the Constitution believed that morality was essential for the well-being of society and the encouragement of religion was the best way to foster that morality. And then based on the historical record of religious declarations and proclamations, Scalia asserted that the Constitution did not require the government neutrality toward religion but could actually favor the prevailing religion of the people. With that type of language, Justice Scalia indicated how this Christian nation perspective might be applied in the law. Well, 10 years following the Ten Commandments case, the court's church state docket uh, for 10 years provided little opportunity for applying Christian nation approach. In 2014, however, the justices revisited the issue of legislative prayers in the Greece versus Galway decision that issue again invited arguments based upon the perceived religious practices of the founders and the purported intent for government to foster religion. The town argued that the constitutionality of public invocations based upon Marsh and the historical legacy of the practices, but supporting Amikai went further. One citing George Washington's first Thanksgiving proclamation for the proposition that quote, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of almighty God. The Declaration of Independence was crafted, quote, in prayer and Bible study, claimed another amicus brief. The institutions of society are founded on the belief that there is an authority higher than the state. That is the moral law, which the state is powerless to alter. That individuals possess rights conferred by the creator, which the government must respect. Once again, the court's opinion upholding the practices steered away from express Christian nation rationalizations. <clears throat> Yet, Justice Kennedy, he opened the door for the court's greater use of history in ways that could be determinative. Rather than the Marsh rule representing an exception to establishment clause, Kennedy remarked, quote, the establishment clause must be interpreted by references to historical practices and understandings. And any test the court adopts must acknowledge the practice that's accepted by the framers who withstood the critical scrutiny of time and political change. And so doing, Justice Kennedy, open the door for more Christian nation-based um, justifications. Um, in some ways, the Greece case, like Marsh, was easy because there actually was a historical pedigree. The clarity becomes more oblique, though, when an exact historical pedigree is missing. And this is when Christian nation arguments become more trouble and misleading because they invite the court to rule by analogy. Does President Washington's issuances of the Thanksgiving proclamation also validate the government's uh, ownership of a religious symbol. Well, that came before the court in 2019 in American Legion versus the American Humanist Association, challenged to the 30-foot 
uh, tall Latin cross monuments on government property. Okay. The cross has withstood this location since 1925 as a tribute to local soldiers who died in World War I. But the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals held the cross represented an unconstitutional endorsement of Christianity. This triggered alarm among religious conservatives and once again, amicus briefs in this appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court brought out the historical uh, practices arguments. Um, claims of the uh, founders' piety figured in prominently into many of the amicus briefs, quote, from the Republic inception from I mean, from the Republic's inception, its founders embraced governmental expressions of religious belief, unabashedly intertwining the secular with the religious, said a group of conservative Christian college professors. Founders engaged in religious expression, Billy Graham Evangelistic Crusade claimed, because, quote, they understood that religious beliefs and ethical principles provided the foundation for and preserved the government and helped set up the Constitution. No brief went as far as the foundation for moral law, amicus brief, however, which boldly asserted that, quote, all valid human law must rest upon revealed law, which is found only in the Holy Scriptures. Brief also cited favorably to that 1811 Ruggles blasphemy decision for the proposition of, quote, whatever strikes at the root of Christianity tends manifestly to the disillusion of civil government. Um, so unlike Marsh and Town versus Greece, the founding era example was missing. So the court in American Legion had to borrow once again by analogy, and that's what Justice Alito did. He declared the court's approach to disputes will once again, quote, look to history for guidance in the void of direct historical evidence, though Alito then analogized to practices and other declarations. He offered a laundry list referencing Washington's Thanksgiving proclamation, farewell address, uh, perennial favorites of Christian nationalists, and even went so far to find evidence in the fact that some cities in the United States, San Diego, Los Angeles, have some type of a religious basis. This all comes together to justify the use of religious language by the government and the recognition of religion generally. So this allows Alito to blithely conclude that, quote, where categories of monuments, symbols, and practices with longstanding history follow in that tradition, they are likewise constitutional. So this expansive view, uh, view of what is relevant history and traditions has often relieved the justices from relying on more expressed Christian nation arguments. But still, there can be no denying that these, are, these arguments have been in the background of many of the religious symbolism cases, uh, particularly in the dissenting opinions of Ann Orton and McCrary County. This constant barrage of amicus priests raising claims of the nation's religious heritage and of the religious beliefs of the founders, purportedly de demonstrated by their occasional use of religious rhetoric, has no doubt had a subtle effect upon judges who are already predisposed to such arguments and who are otherwise hostile to a regime of church-state separation. The emboldened Christian nation arguments have helped install, at least at a minimum, a jurisprudence of Christian nation life, despite this concept actually being a historical myth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, uh, do you mind uh, unsharing your screen? Sure. Let me get rid of this. Hold on a second. There we go. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we're moving into a, a half an hour uh, uh, discussion period where we can uh, ask questions about any of uh, the uh, panelists. And I'm going to use my prerogative as the moderator to ask the first question. But if anyone has a question, uh, you should put it in the, the Q&A. Um, and unfortunately, you know, as a law professor, my, uh, my question is probably going to be one of these long rambly questions that sounds like a comment uh, and less of a question, but it, I promise you it will end up as a, as a question. So, and it's a question really taught to any of our, our panelists. And, and, and let me frame it this way. The question for, that, the, that this symposium asks is, is this a Christian nation? And I'm, I'm just wondering, how do we go about answering that question? That is, do, can we actually answer the question of whether this is a Christian nation by looking at 
what the founders said and what they thought or what Roger Williams said and thought or what Thomas Jefferson said and thought. To me, the question of national identity, you know, is a very, com- is a very complex one. I mean, as scholars like Roger Smith have shown, we have competing nationalist traditions. That is, there are, uh, you know, from the founding or before, there have been people who have thought that being American was defined at least in part by being Protestant and white and uh, male, or at least men should be the ones in charge, and that this was all part of being American. And there are people who continue to believe that being, being like a real American or authentic American is determined at least in part by these ascriptive identities. And these, this position has had a lot of power in American life and has guided policies. Um, so I just think that the question of national identity often gets confused with the separate question of how do we interpret the Constitution, right? That is, should we interpret the Constitution as giving some privileged status to Christianity? Um, and it's probably because we think of the Constitution as somehow a mirror of the country. That is, the Constitution embodies who we are as a people. So if we're a Christian people, then the Constitution must be Christian. Or if the or vice versa. If the Constitution is Christian, then we must be Christian. But I do wonder, and this is this is now I'm about to ask the actual question: whether uh, it, it, you think that these two questions are really one and the same. That is, the question of the meaning of the Constitution and the status of Christianity under the Constitution is it really one and the same with the question that the symposium frames: is this a Christian nation? That is, this question of national identity aren't they separate and sh- and can we really answer one by answering the other? So there's that's it's a long and rambly question, but I'll, but I'll throw it out to any of our panelists who want to take take that on. I, um, you know, I might start. This is not a new question. The question you're asking, um, in in my essay, I point out William Plumber, who's a Presbyterian minister raises exactly this question in the early 19th century. He says, if by Christian nation, so it's all about definitions. What do you mean by Christian nation? Marcy was addressing this as well. If by Christian nation, you mean the majority of people in America are Christian. Now, by the way, for the first time in U.S. history, the majority of Americans are not white Christians in the last 10 years. But Plumer says, if that's what you mean, yeah, okay, we're a Christian nation. But if what you mean is we ought to, by our laws, give Christians entitled to any civil, political, or religious privileges, except in common with Jews, deists, and atheists, then I utterly reject it. So, um, I, I mean, I think to some extent, your, your question just points out the importance of definitions. Well, and, and I would just add, I, I think it points out, I mean, my project, of course, is intellectual history. We can't say that there was no Christian influences on the Constitution. That's not supportable. So we have to figure out, well, what were they and how do we describe them and how do we treat them now? So, which is why I never get into the First Amendment or any of that, um, although you, know, you could take Madison and, and train them right back over into drafting the First Amendment. But, but my point is that what we need is fact-based history about Christian, the Christian role, um, but also if, if the Constitution is reformed and always reforming, the question is what it is right now, uh, not what it was at the time that the seeds were planted. And so, um, and so that may end up conflating your two questions, but I, I think as a matter of history, they're separate. It's I like, that, um, go ahead. So yeah, so like like uh, Marcy, I'm a you know, political theorist and intellectual historian, and I, I suppose what interests but also worries me is you know uh, uh, Professor Green brought out very well the way in which a kind of revisionist and partisan history is being told about the about the founding on the Christian right, but I I also see as the same kind of instrumentalizing or, or sort of partisan take on that history on on the side of not perhaps of the left, but of secular liberals who want to sort of secularize the founding in a way that just isn't supportable either. And so, you know, my, my historical interests are primarily in the, in the 17th century, but what I'd like to do is just recover the fact that these are really complex questions. There are many different theories and practices on the table. And it is the case that a lot of things that modern liberals assume to be safely secular are in fact adapt- adaptations of ecclesiological and quite controversial ecclesiological and theological 
claims. And I think disestablishment itself is so clearly this. Disestablishment is just such a radical, fringe, wacky, evangelical position in the 17th century. But the kind of story you want to tell of like, oh, this is just a kind of mainstream, sort of rational conclusion doesn't even fly for the 18th century. You really can't erase the evangelical contribution at that stage. And so I had sort of a, a kind of worry about maybe the presentation of the founding that, that Stephen gave us. Um, but yeah, so, but again, I would just want to hold to our job as scholars is to recover the, the complex facts of the matter rather than sort of weigh in definitively on a kind of highly controversial and partisan issue in the present. Yeah, I didn't get into uh, part of the paper and clearly did not get into the books I've written about this rather extensively. Um, the information. And um, I agree, and I think what we need to do is one, not, not um, superimpose our understanding of secularism from the 21st century onto the latter part of the 18th century. That's clearly an artificial approach. Um, but we also need to, to just kind of qualify a little bit what Marcy said. Um, I, I think that we also need to be careful about not kind of, and I'm saying Marcy's doing this, um, uh, this is actually part of what the modern way of thinking about this is. And this is part of the problem with going back and looking in the history is to, to do it in kind of a binary way. And to a certain extent, your, your statement, Teresa, what you just said, yeah. Um, modifications of Christian ideas, Christian principles. Um, I don't think Marx is saying this, and she can correct me if she's wrong. I, I don't think the founders of the Constitution were in, were utilizing or imposing what they actually thought were solely and directly Calvinist principles into the yeah, Constitution. That's right. These were principles that had been adapted and had evolved, right? I mean, right. Right. Enlightenment they, you know what they were, they were tools. A, that were enlightenment thought was a modification of Christian ideas and a different way of thinking about the acquisition of knowledge, but it still was in response to Christian ideals. And so there was not a Christian view of the Constitution or a secular view of the Constitution at the time. It was this hybrid that had grown up, right? And so this is part of the problem is that the Christian nation, uh, Christian nationalists, they go back and cherry pick and they look at this particular rhetoric, which was prevalent during this time for a whole lot of reasons we could get into. Um, and then they say, ah, this means the same thing that it means today. Whereas they were talking in very nuanced terms back then too. And so there are many reasons they used religious rhetoric. And without a doubt, by virtue of the prevalence of religion in that time period, they could not disassociate themselves, talking about the founders, from this particular influence. And that's clearly true. Um, but to pick back up on just the other thing about what Jared said about this, the distinction between um, national identity and uh, then the constitution, I'm actually glad you said it because to a certain extent in, in my 2015 book on inventing a Christian America, that actually is part of my argument. It's part of the reason that this narrative became so popular in the 19th century when it was not that kind of express narrative in the latter part of the 18th century. No one was talking in those kinds of terms. Is because there was a search for a national identity and a search for a way of trying to explain who we were as a people and with the influence of evangelical Christianity arising in the Second Great Awakening, there was a pre-position that they wanted it to reflect that evangelical perspective. And then they had to somehow then kind of make that consistent with what happened during the founding period. And it is very clear in looking at, at, at many of the sermons, papers, biographies, etc., of the early part of the 19th century of this, the best word is it's just revisionism, to going back and reading, writing in to these histories, which then became the histories in public schools throughout the rest of the 19th century, about what the founding period really was about and infusing it with a very strong Christian influence as opposed to something that was a whole lot more complex. All right, I'm turning over moderating duties to uh, Carl since I have to go teach, but it's, uh, it's been a great conversation. I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Jaron. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Professor Marianne Case, um, who's one of the speakers this afternoon. 
uh, and she writes, I heard you, and since uh, she typed this when you were speaking, um, John, I assume um, this is uh, to, uh, to you, John Augusta, um, I heard you quote a framing era source to the effect that the Greeks and Romans did not unite church and state. Can you say more about what the framers thought the Romans were doing in this regard? Um, th thank you, Carl. No, it, it wasn't that the uh, Greeks and Romans didn't unite church and state. They, they did various things that you could say did. The point was being made that you don't have to have Christianity. And, and this point was being made by the evangelicals. Government doesn't have to support Christianity in order to have a moral, virtuous system. Um, and, and again, all of this is in contradistinction to what Marcy is raising about checks and balances and, and the structure of the system. But even if you want a, a government which is made up of moral and virtuous people, uh, what the evangelicals were saying is that doesn't require government support for Christianity. Again, it's very much this Jeffersonian nation of universal morality. I mean, you might say that it, it, Roger Williams made exactly the same point, is that you've had flourishing civilizations that were not Christian in which non-Christian religions were established, and you can't say that those civilizations were lacking in civil virtue, right? Um, so it's, again, one of the themes that I've kind of noticed ac across the panels, which is worth bringing out, is just the extent to which the secular and the kind of radical evangelical case for church-state separation in the 17th century and also in the 18th century was really explicitly oriented against a kind of um, Hebraizing Protestantism that saw the point of, that saw that the work of the Christian Republic to be kind of building the old, you know, building a Republic on the Old Testament model in New England, which is very much what people like John Eliot or John Winthrop were trying to do. Uh, whereas William says, no, 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 we're Christians. Right, we have this thing called the New Testament, you know, the New Testament supersedes the Old Testament. And so the kind of wedding of church and state that produces a kind of national church is just not, um, I mean, you might make the joke, it's just not kosher uh, <laughs> under the Christian dispensation. And so I think that kind of story has been lost. And one of the things, again, that sort of worries me about the kind of, you know, binary that we're working with Christian or secular is just that it includes the, just the the vast array of Protestantisms and and the kind of infighting that was there. And I think that that's actually where the action was um, for so much of this. And we're really kind of cutting ourselves off at the knees if, if we don't, you know, want to get to grips with those kind of theological arguments by saying, oh, well, they're not, they're not arguments. They're, you know, they're dogma or something. I completely agree with Teresa on this. And I, I mean, when I start my classes on religious liberty or the establishment clause, I always start with the ways in which Massachusetts uh, Congregationalists and others were uh, literally attacking, not just taxing, but attacking uh, the Quakers and, uh, and the Baptists. Uh, and the fact that Baptists are the ones that conceived of this concept of separation of church and state. But the other thing I think that everyone needs to remember um, throughout all of this is that, you know, we remember Benjamin Franklin and the Quakers for their toleration. Well, they were tolerant, but you couldn't even serve in government in the state of Pennsylvania unless you were a Quaker. Uh, you had to have seen the light of the Quaker light in order to serve in the government. So, you know, we started with diversity from day one and it was warring diversity. It was not a, you know, a kumbaya of, of uh, pluralism. Uh, it's, and, I'm so glad you brought that up about Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania, you know, partisans of Pennsylvania want to say, oh, it was as tolerant as Rhode Island. And that's just not the case. No, not true. <laughs> not, and I'm at Penn and I mean, my God, I'm not allowed to say anything against Benjamin Franklin ever. But, <laughs> but the point is that um, the Quakers were very oppressive. Uh, and it, it was, they felt sorry for the ones who didn't believe the truth the way they did and, and thought they would see it eventually. But since they hadn't seen it yet, they could not serve in the government, so. Um, we have here a question from uh, Andrew Seidel, and I'll take this opportunity of, of thanking um, Andrew, uh, who is a staff attorney with the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and, um, Rebecca Mark, uh, Market, who is also a staff attorney for the Freedom From Religion Foundation and an alumna of the Roger Williams University School of Law. 
um, for um, being the terrific resources to me and, and helping uh, put this uh, symposium together. Andrew asked the following question. The concept of official capacity versus private capacity regarding promoting religion seems a clean cut way to decide cases. Mr. Jefferson can pray. President Jefferson cannot call for prayer. Have the courts used this helpful dichotomy? And if so, when did they move away from it? Anybody? The, um, I mean, I was raising the dichotomy. Uh, the courts have referred to it, although the best quotation I can think of is Justice Stevens and Van Orden, uh, and, uh, which unfortunately he was in dissent. And he makes very specifically the point that, look, when a public official gives a speech, we understand the difference between what's their personal statements, and especially during a political campaign, versus what, what's their official statements. And the, the doctrine has been fairly well established. This is why it's just an outrage if a president actually stood in the White House to make a political speech. I mean, that would be outrageous uh, for the president to do. It's you know not been done in the past. Um, so, so the distinction has always been there. Um, do the courts rely on it now? No, unfortunately. I mean, in some of these modern cases that Stephen's talking about, um, they've not really uh, been as careful about that. Although most of the cases have not focused on the question of what the official can do in this sense. Most of them have been, you know, more focused on, uh, you know, Christmas displays or, you know, uh, Ten Commandment displays. But I think if they came back to this doctrine, it would actually be uh, fairly helpful to create a foundation for, uh, we're not saying people aren't religious. We're not suggesting that, that uh, to talk about a wall of separation makes America irreligious or somehow disrespects Christianity. It's, you can't be, again, exactly this point that Reverend William Plumer is raising back in the 1840s. You can't be officially religious, um, is what they were saying. Yeah, Andrew, the, uh, when you look at the amicus piece in particular, that I spent a fair amount of time in preparing this article. But then even in the opinions uh, that I was mentioning, uh, the emphasis always is on these being kind of official declarations because that's what they want. They want it to basically have the, uh, the imprimatur that it's the state is somehow behind these statements of these public officials that therefore constitutionalizes it and makes the establishment clause difference. I think it's hard to make a clear distinction though between when someone is a public official, particularly for the president and you're on, you know, you're on your job 24 seven, at least supposedly, that you can really kind of put aside when you are speaking officially or privately, uh, that becomes a very difficult and uh, line to make. And I think courts are struggling with that. I'll just say as a side, not in the, in the uh, establishment clause context, uh, I was actually just teaching this case yesterday in my First Amendment class. It's the case that's going up. It's out, out of the, the uh, Court of Appeals. It's uh, Knight Institute versus Trump, which deals with a challenge to Trump trying to place controls on his Twitter feed. And when he Twitters, when he tweets, and then people make comments, he has censored the comments that he doesn't like. And this has gone up through the courts and the courts so far have basically said, this is actually your official statements, even though you're claiming these are private statements. And so we actually may get some clarity of exactly what the difference is between an official comment by someone and a private comment by someone. But at least in this case going up about uh, Trump's tweets, uh, the courts are pretty much saying, no, these are your official statements. Therefore, you cannot start censoring uh, the, the platform the public forum that you've created uh, just because you disagree with it. Yeah. To, to Stephen's point, by the way, the Hatch Act does make exactly the distinction that Stephen raises. The president is not subject directly to the Hatch yeah. Act restrictions because there's a recognition. He's the president. When he talks, you know, how do you know if it's political or, or uh, personal? But with other officials, they're supposed to be bound. I just say there's a 17th century parallel, of course, uh, for this, which is that in the letter concerning toleration, Locke specifies that the magistrate can, and actually as a Christian, must proselytize for his Christian faith. But as 
a private person, not in his official capacity. But of course, that just begs this question about the platform. I mean, necessarily a magistrate has superior resources at his disposal in sort of making his particular persuasion seem particularly persuasive to others. And so I just think that like a lot, a lot of the questions that we seem to be viewing as new in terms of social media and the kind of ambigu ambiguity of these platforms are actually kind of quite old. Uh, and you know, the, the, they're there from the beginning. Uh, Roger Williams student, um, Philip Primo asked the following question. Uh, Professor Hamilton, why shouldn't we take the position of Story and Kent with respect to the relationship between Christianity and the common law as persuasive evidence against your thesis? Story joined the Marshall Court in 1812. Kent assumed the chancellorship of New York in 1814. These men lived in close proximity to the framing and flourished while many members of the founding generation yet lived. Moreover, wasn't James Wilson of a similar mind? At least Story, Kent, Wilson, etc., suggests that the identity of America as a Christian nation is at least ambiguous too. Question. So, so of course, my point is that if, and I'm just doing a strictly intellectual history question, right? Who influenced the framers and who influenced the most framers and uh, of the most influential framers, who influenced them? And all roads lead to Witherspoon and to Presbyterian precepts that, uh, I mean, for, for even uh, Madison to say that he received a strong dose of Calvinism, that's an understatement. Calvinists are not subtle, uh, as speaking strictly <laughs> as a Presbyterian here, um, not subtle at all. And, you know, Princeton was the only university in the United States where the, the goal was to produce people who would serve in government or serve the common good. Uh, it, the, the high point of every other university um, that was feeding into the convention was to create clergy. And so there was something very special about Princeton at the time that it was aiming to produce people of public service. And so I, I think you can't discount the education of uh, 10 of the framers and you certainly can't discount the fact that uh, the, the principles that you see at play in the classroom for those framers are precisely the principles you see applied. The, this concept of it, it, it's not that monarchy, direct democracy, or, or representative democracy are um, any of them better than the other, frankly. It's that they're tools, that they're mechanisms. This was precisely the way that Witherspoon taught the, the um, formation of the government should happen. Um, but also there's this historical accident that the uh, problem with the Articles of Confederation was that they were a complete failure. Um, but why were they a failure? They were a failure because they did not unite the people and because of corruption. Corruption in the state legislatures, corruption on the in the border skirmishes, et cetera. So if you look at it from that perspective, what I, uh, the only claim I'm making, it's actually a pretty small claim, um, but it is that the attitude toward human nature at the, at the convention itself was framed by Presbyterian and John Knox principles that in my view bring into serious doubt whether or not they were going to impose an all-knowing Christian philosophy or set of beliefs on the structure. Instead, they walked in, we failed already with the articles. Now we're probably going to fail again. And the reason we're going to fail is against humans are a failure. So we'll do the best we can, but that's all we've got. Um, and so I think that ends up being brilliant in producing a constitution that can thrive. But that's my own editorial comment there at the end. Can I just spin that into a question for John? Well, as to the history, I mean, the, the, the question is missing the history. 
Justice Story, who is a child when the Constitution is drafted and the First Amendment is drafted, he writes in On the Constitution in 1833 that the Massachusetts establishment is the proper means of having a government-state relationship, a government-religious tax. He writes that, uh, I think, the same year or maybe a couple years before the Massachusetts people reject that 10 to 1 in favor of a church-state separation. Uh, just uh, Kent, Chancellor Kent, who has the language Stephen was quoting, uh, he's called to task at the next New York State Constitutional Convention, where the other delegates to the State Constitutional Convention give him holy hell, uh, if you'll excuse me, because they say, what, what are you saying? This is a Christian nation. That's outrageous. We have uh, freedom of religion. We have separation of church and state. And at the New York Constitutional Convention, he backs off and he says, oh, no, no, no. Uh, and by the way, this is not what he had said in Ruggles, but he says, no, 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 all I meant was that demographically, we are primarily Christian, and so Ruggles' statement was an incitement to riot. But to turn to, you know, based on this history, to turn to Story and Kent as if we should listen to them rather than Madison and Jefferson or Franklin or Adams is frankly just historically uh, completely ahistorical. Right. Can I just sort of, Marcy's comment really um, made me think about um, something that I don't think that we talk enough about, and I've tried to get at in my paper, but just the extent to which um, the establishment question was bound up with questions about the role of universities as the chief institutions for credentialing clergy. And that was something that was obviously the case in, in, in England and was clearly brought to America as well. Um, and so, I don't know, I, I just, in the case of Jefferson, right, I think so often we tell this story of, well, Jefferson was all about, you know, disestablishment, and then he also had these views on public education, right? Um, but actually, I don't know, I, I would, I don't do this in my paper, but I would sort of want to make the argument that actually, well, that the, the education ar argument is part of the establishment argument. He just thinks that universities should be educating reasonable gentlemen, well, the, the problem is he establishes the University of Virginia, which is arguably the first truly secular university in the world. He insists there will be no professor of divinity. He insists there will be no religious services at the university. He is required for budgetary reasons to compromise and say, well, maybe you can use the rotunda if a minister wants to come in and preach on a Sunday. But he refuses to allow that while he's alive. But this is my this is exactly my point. Actually, is that the, 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 he wants the universities to be sort of free from any particular religious denomination because he wants a kind of secular clergy, if you will. He wants sort of the men who go through this institution not to make that mistake. He, I, I don't think. The, the, to say to Jefferson he wanted secular clergy, I think his mind, his head would blow up. Um, he I doesn't. He he doesn't so, want, yeah, the, the I, if I might finish, he, he doesn't <laughs> want secular clergy. He wants enlightened individuals. He wants people that are going to use their mind rationally to expand their thinking and to understand things. He believes, and this is maybe what you're getting at, Teresa. He certainly believes that their rational minds would lead them to a belief in God. Uh, he believes that their rational minds would lead them to a sound religion. That religion is very Unitarian, it's very low church, but it, it's not to create clergy. I mean, the world had switched. We're now more interested in law. What he says is, we're creating government officials. We want lawyers. Exactly. Uh, so right. instead of clergy. educating clergy, right. universities now are educating lawyers who still have to be trained and credentialed in these institutions. I just think that we're, we're thinking too narrowly uh, when we think about establishment apart from the question of education, who's doing it, who's credentialing. Sorry, Carl. No, it, it, it pains me to interrupt the spirit of discussion. It's fabulous. And I wish we could just keep going, but we're trying to, try to, uh, main you know stay on time we've got lots of other great questions i can't get to we have a very short break and i know people need uh you know, there's something called zoom fatigue and i also know that people in theater say always leave when the audience wants more always stop when the audience still wants more so we only have a short lunch break of i think 15 minutes uh we're gonna we're gonna start it now because i think people want to rush out and 
and grab a sandwich, and we will resume at uh, one thirty. Is one thirty? Is that right on this on my schedule? Is that right when we're resuming? Uh, it is right. So we'll be back at one thirty. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs>